Welcome to College Surgeon Heights Collegiate Remembrance Day service. Today's service may look different from the previous years, but it continues to be an opportunity for us to look forward as well as honor the past. We begin by acknowledging that we are on Treaty 1 land, the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. The land connects us all. Thank you for viewing our virtual Remembrance Day service today. Though we are not physically together, we are together in spirit and in reflection. Please be thoughtful and mindful throughout today's service and beyond. While you listen, please refrain from clapping or speaking. Rather, let us all use the time to reflect and think of how we can make a difference in the world. Because we all can make a difference, we all need to make a difference in order to make the world a better place. Now we ask everyone to stand and remove their hats for our national anthem. Oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot Lord, in all of us command, Over the course of the two world wars, over 111,000 Canadian soldiers sacrificed their lives in hope for freedom for our country. These selfless individuals are not just a statistic we bring up annually on this day of remembrance. Many other brave and courageous Canadians also gave up their lives in other wars, some who are still alive today with the scars garnished within their bodies and mind. These soldiers were somebody's child, somebody's parent, somebody's friend. Remembrance Day can be difficult. It can provoke grief and sorrow, and amongst many other emotions that may be overwhelming. Please be mindful of what this day can represent for your friends, classmates, teachers, and those in the community. At College Surgeon Heights Collegiate, we remember those who fought for the liberties we have today. However, we also acknowledge and give thanks to those currently enlisted in the Canadian Armed Forces their commitment and dedication to donate their time and lives to keep us protected, not only during times of war, but during national crises such as the COVID-19 pandemic is invaluable and irreplaceable. We will be forever grateful for your contributions. As a young person, just like many of you, I strive for a future without violence, a future with respect for our differences, a future with compassion for one another, with the freedom and liberties Canadians have today, we have the power to do what we want, but with much hate and resentment existing in the world, it begs the question, what are we doing with our freedom? As humans, we are quick to turn our backs and hold resentment towards each other based on our unique traits, such as race, gender, sexuality, and more. For some, assumptions can manifest in many ways, prejudice, discrimination, and in some cases, violence as a supposed answer but many forget about, about understanding, how a conversation can dispel misconceptions and fill those voids with enlightenment and diverse perspectives. These discussions transform into connections that can build a barrier against hate so that all can experience freedom, a future without violence. Throughout today's ceremony and after, I encourage you to reflect on the following questions. Are we using the freedom we have today to create positive interactions and changes? Are we helping to liberate the oppressed from discrimination? Are we carrying on their legacy of freedom for all Canadians? Substantial and meaningful change requires persistence and perseverance. 
I know with self-awareness and education from all of us, we will achieve a greater future for all, a future that knows peace for all. Canada's military history is more than just dates and battles. Our history is people. For more than 100 years, Canada's sailors, soldiers, aviators, and special forces have risked their lives for one common goal, building a better world. Some have served overseas, protecting our allies and upholding the rights and freedoms of others. Some have helped out in their communities in times of need, after fires, floods, or throughout the pandemic. Each one has a unique story. Veterans Week is a time to remember their service and their sacrifice. A time to remember their selflessness and their unwavering belief in democracy and peace. I'm so honored to share some of their stories with you today. Stories that inspire me to be a better member of the military, a better Canadian, and a better person. I want you to imagine this. It's 1916. You're a young person full of energy. You've left your family back home in Newfoundland and are now in France, near the village of beaumont anel You're ready to fight to bring peace and safety back to Europe. It's July 1st and you and 800 of your comrades in arms advance towards the front line. You continue to fight as those beside you fall. You keep pressing forward long into the night. The next morning, only you and 67 others from your regiment answer the roll call. 700 brave troops are not with you that morning. Some are missing, some are wounded, and some will never answer the call again. That is the terrible cost of war. Over 62,000 Canadians died in the First World War, including roughly 1,300 soldiers from the Dominion of Newfoundland, who proudly served in their regiment as Newfoundland was not yet a Canadian province. We remember their incredible sacrifices and the sacrifices of those who were injured or struggled with their mental health when they came home. But we must also recognize that not everyone was allowed to serve equally like the members of the number two construction battalion. In the early years of the First World War, many black Canadians were denied entry into the Canadian military because of the color of their skin. They refused to take no for an answer, and in 1916, volunteers all, they were allowed to serve as part of a segregated non-combatant unit in France. Their determination to serve their country despite the biases that they had faced is something we should never forget. Thankfully, the soldiers of Number 2 Construction Battalion are finally receiving the recognition they were due over 100 years ago. Their story is one of tremendous courage and valor in the face of hate and discrimination. It is an example of the resilience, selflessness, and dedication of those who have fought for our country. And it is a reminder that we still have work to do to fight against racism and injustice here at home. We must also remember our veterans who served in the Second World War. Soldiers like Warrant Officer Second Class John Robert Osborne, who led his company to recapture Mount Butler during the defense of Hong Kong in 1941. They charged with their bayonets and they seized the summits from the Japanese forces. But by mid-afternoon, they were surrounded and running low on ammunition and supplies. As bullets and grenades rained down on them, John Osborne courageously picked up many of the live Japanese grenades and threw them back at the enemy. But there was one he could not get to in time. He yelled for his platoon to clear the area, pushed his men aside, and threw himself on the explosive. He was killed instantly. His courage saved many lives, and he was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross for his valor. Ten years later, and a few thousand kilometers away, roughly 700 Canadians would help defend a force of 5,000 Chinese soldiers at Kapyong during the Korean War. They were outnumbered, but not outmatched. They fought valiantly and they persevered. While the Battle of Kapyong was on land, Canadians in Korea also served in the air and on the seas. In the skies, they destroyed enemy jet fighters and transported people and much needed cargo. And on the water, sailors like Ted Jamison, an Indigenous Canadian Armed Forces member from the Six Nations Upper Cayuga Band, help patrol the coasts, disrupt enemy supplies, and conduct a surveillance. Chief Petty Officer First Class Jamison 
was an expert in anti-submarine warfare and deployed to Korea on HMCS Iroquois. He was on board Iroquois when the ship was attacked on October 2, 1952, an attack that led to the Royal Canadian Navy's only battle casualties during the Korean conflict. He survived and came home to share his vast knowledge with others as a senior instructor at the artillery school in Halifax. Shortly after the Korean War, the United Nations launched its first large-scale peacekeeping effort in response to the Suez Crisis. In November of 1956, Canadian forces joined nine other countries in the Middle East as part of the first United Nations Emergency Force. Their efforts helped end the crisis and brought peace to the region for the next 10 years. In the early 90s, Canadian Armed Forces returned to the Middle East, serving in the Gulf War. This year marks the 30th anniversary of the end of that conflict. More than 4,000 Canadians served in the Persian Gulf region from 1990 to 1991, including Major Lynn Doucette, an air weapons controller from Inganish Beach, Nova Scotia. She deployed to the Persian Gulf in 1991 and was posted to an American air base in Turkey. There, she commanded a U.S. Airborne Warning and Control System aircraft. She kept a careful eye on the enemy and reported what she saw on the radar to the generals on the ground. She recommended what actions they should take. But she faced significant barriers as a woman in uniform. Local cultural restrictions at the Turkish airbase banned women from entering the operations centers. She was denied her seat at the table due to her gender, but she was undeterred and continued to perform her duty with excellence and bravery. Her work and that of her comrades in arms was the key to maintaining control over the sky during the Persian Gulf War. We've answered the call time and time again. Following the attacks on September 11, 2001, we began our combat operations in Afghanistan. Over 40,000 Canadian Armed Forces members fought bravely to help the people of that country in their time of need. Besides the dangers of combat, the conditions were harrowing and left lasting scars on many who served. They faced extreme heat, dust storms, and the constant threat of roadside bombs or other explosive device. 158 Canadian military members made the ultimate sacrifice including Captain Nicola Goddard. She was a strong leader and a respected officer who believed in building a better world for others. And she remains an inspiration to those who serve today. Today, I and other people like me carry on the legacy of those who came before us, working on the ground, in the air, and at sea. Our operations across the globe are all about supporting our allies and partners. And here at home, when disaster strikes, we're always ready to help Canadians in need. No matter what, we find a way to help. We adapt, we learn, and we take on new roles. Because at the end of the day, that's why we joined the Canadian Armed Forces, to defend Canada and Canadians. To do good in the world, to live a life of purpose and meaning. So whenever you can, I encourage you to reflect on the efforts of our Canadian Armed Forces members, both past and present. Celebrate the lives of those who made it home, who survived to have families and to grow old. Honor those who did not. And remember that today, there are thousands of members who put their lives on the line in defense of our country, our people, and our values. Lest we forget. Thank you.
finish line is six feet in the ground. of the song. The battlefield gunfire mauls. The sound is just like thunder calls. From lightning breed still strikes that kill, igniting flames in forests still. Of hopes deprived, then lives of nil, like fire set upon to kill. There are lives at cost, lives living and lost. Human lives at cost to bring power to a crownless king. Their lives are lost from slashes of reality as each soldier finds their lives a tragedy that's ripped apart and torn from heart, where crimson blood flows into mud. When lives are lost, world peace is tossed, and flies into a wall, where bayonets and thorny nets create a tragic fall. Yet when the world looks back to see those who fought to set us free, a single life is a calamity, many lives lost a mere figure. We do not exist to wage war's vigor. We exist for something in the future. We are to be loved, things are to be used. But these things are treated wayward, until this is corrected, then and only then will our rights be many and equal. Only then will we know. Then our earth shan't have more war. N'oublions jamais. Le jour du souvenir est l'occasion de donner notre respect et notre gratitude aux membres actifs et anciens qui ont donné leur vie à la défense de notre pays. Prenez le temps d'honorer les personnes qui ont servi notre pays et remercie-les des sacrifices qu'elles ont faits.
100 years ago, an inspiring woman had a vision, a bright red poppy to honor veterans who lost their lives in the First World War and to help raise support funds to help others in the aftermath. The idea was conceived by Madame Anna Guérin of France, sparked by John McRae's poem in Flanders Fields. Anna had originally founded a charity to help rebuild war-torn regions of France after the First World War. Poppies made of fabric were sold to help her charity. She presented the concept to France's allies, including the Great War Veterans Association in Canada, which later became the Royal Canadian Legion. The idea was adopted, and the poppy symbol made its first appearance in Canada on July 6, 1921, the year of the first poppy campaign to support our veterans. To mark the symbol's 100th anniversary in 2021, the Royal Canadian Legion produced a replica of the original fabric pin. The familiar image has come to reflect the sacrifices of fallen Canadian veterans from all arms of the military and from all missions, including two world wars, Korea, Afghanistan, Bosnia, peacekeeping duties, and other assignments. Canada's Parliament entrusted the Legion with the exclusive right to use the poppy as the nation's symbol of remembrance and to safeguard its image, a pledge it honors today. 100 years later, the symbol is unmistakable. Its meaning still deep. The poppy of remembrance honors sacrifice. Poppy of Remembrance cries never again. The Poppy of Remembrance reflects solace and support. Anna Garen's vision lives on. To learn more about how the Legion helps veterans, visit legion.ca. In Flanders Fields by John McRae. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow, between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead, short days ago. We lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders Fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw. The torch be yours to hold it high, if ye break faith with us who die. We shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields.
They were young as we are young. They served, giving freely of themselves. To them we pledge, amid the winds of time, to carry their torch and never forget. We will remember them. A message from the Government of Canada. As we close the service today, may we always be mindful of the many sacrifices made by the members of the Canadian Armed Forces so that we may live in peace. Thank you for viewing our Collège Sturgeon Heights Collegiate's Remembrance Day service, and thank you to the contributing students and Sturgeon Heights staff for making today's service possible. Tomorrow, and every on Remembrance Day, all Canadians are encouraged to stop whatever they are doing at 11 a.m., pause, remain silent, and take time to remember the brave men and women who lost their lives at the times of war. We must reflect and honour our fallen veterans and all members of the Canadian Armed Forces. We thank them for their service. This concludes our Remembrance Day service.